Well, earlier this year, the EU controversially labelled nuclear as a green option. And that was well received by companies like the US firm Lightbridge, which is working on a new form of nuclear energy that it says is safer than ever. And I've been speaking to its chief executive. Seth Gray, a real pleasure having you on my show. Thanks for your time. And Seth, let's just start with this. Just how much is the nuclear industry able to, to step up to the challenge of supplying all this extra energy needed if we are to move away from carbon intensive sources? Well, I think the nuclear industry can step up more than any other industry. Right now, there are reactors that are slated to close in Europe that can stay open, provide power, avoid providing hard currency or rubles to Putin for his war, and can also save natural gas for storage in Europe and in the UK for use during the winter for heat rather than using it for non-heat electricity. Nuclear has the ability to scale up over the coming decade really faster than any other way other than relying on petro dictators for fossil fuels. But Seth, I'm wondering what sort of time scales are we talking about here? Because nuclear power stations notoriously take years to build and let's be frank, they can cost a fortune. Well, first of all, what we're talking about when we're talking about keeping plants open that uh, are slated to close soon is something that can be done immediately. And then we could look mm. at plants that have been closed relatively recently, particularly in Germany, that perhaps could be reopened and other plants that over the coming couple of years might have been slated to close that could either keep operating or actually go through power up rates to increase the amount of power that come out of existing plants. And when we look at the reasons why nuclear plants have been delayed, have gone over budget, they're not due to the nuclear part of the reactor. They're not due to the nuclear fuel or the core. The delays are due to complex large welding and electrical work and piping and complex concrete pours. The same reasons why we're seeing bridges go over budget, behind schedule in Europe, the UK, around the world. And in places where several reactors are built, like in the United Arab Emirates or in South Korea, and the skilled workers hone these trades, we see that reactors can be deployed on schedule, on budget. And just briefly, Seth, does any of this make financial sense? I mean, can it really compete with renewables? It's the only thing that makes sense. Renewables will provide at most a quarter to a third of the power needed in any particular area due to intermittency of when the sun shines, when the wind blows, and we're simply not anywhere near time when we have large-scale economic battery storage to store the power from renewables, and nuclear has a three million to one energy density advantage over fossil fuels. The amount of nuclear fuel to power one entire lifetime in the Western world is about the size of a can of Coca-Cola. This is something that really is necessary to wean us off fossil fuels and also stop dumping carbon into the atmosphere. What about, Seth, the, the reliance on Russia in this nuclear power world? I mean, again, these are the numbers I've got. Russia owns something like 40% of the world's uranium conversion infrastructure. That's what you need, of course, to turn uranium ore, what we dig out of the ground, into nuclear fuel. Can this really be done without Russia? And also, currently, the largest producer of uranium ore, by far, is Kazakhstan, one of Russia's closest allies. Well, in terms of conversion, next year the United States will reopen a conversion plant in Illinois. Canada has a lot of conversion, as do uh, several European countries, particularly France. And these are plants that can be expanded, new plants can be built. I, I, I don't think relying on Russia for conversion is something that will prevent the growth of the nuclear power industry at all. Seth, I want to talk to you about your company, Lightbridge, uh, bear with me here, because it specializes in making more efficient nuclear fuel. How much scope for power expansion is there just by tweaking what we already have? Because as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, the idea is to get more from what's currently being used from power stations, as you've mentioned, already up and running, just by changing, simply by changing the nature of the, the nuclear material being used. Is that right? 
So Lightbridge has reimagined nuclear fuel. We're designing it, we're testing it, we have a strategic relationship with the U.S. government to do this in U.S. government facilities and national laboratories. And this fuel will bring a tremendous increase in power to the existing reactors or new ones. And the fuel also really breaks the chain between anything between nuclear fuel and something that can be used in a nuclear weapon. So th this is a fuel that also has tremendous safety uh, advancements in what, within what's called a design basis loss of coolant accident, to use the technical term. This fuel won't produce hydrogen, which is what exploded at Fukushima. So what we've reimagined and are now testing is really a unique, tremendous leap forward for the nuclear power industry, for the existing big reactors and the coming small ones. And Seth, let me end on this, what some people call the holy grail, nuclear fusion, a potential source of almost unlimited power. Are we anywhere close to it? Well, the only one we're close to is the sun, and we're getting closer to commercial nuclear fusion. But in terms of reliable, large-scale economic production of fusion power, we're, we're probably still a few decades away. Well... On that note, Seth Gray, a real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for your time, and I'd love to talk to you again soon. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Well, that